Hello everybody, Resonance here, and today I'll be giving you all my tutorial on the basics of competitive Pokémon. Much like Age of Empires 2, Pokémon is a game that defined my childhood, and I was pleasantly surprised to find out that not only does Age of Empires 2 have an incredibly rich competitive scene, but so does Pokémon as well. Pokémon is one of the deepest strategy games out there, and during this video, I'll be going over everything you need to know to get started. The first thing you need to know is that playing competitive Pokémon is completely free, and extremely easy to get into thanks to the website Pokémon Showdown. Simply go to play.pokemonshowdown.com and click Choose Name in the top right to sign up for an account. You don't need to own any of the games to get started. It's really that easy and completely free. Pokémon Showdown is a feature-complete online battle simulator that you can play in your browser, and it does not have any single-player content, just battles. But it does offer the complete multiplayer experience for Pokémon, with no grinding or prerequisites. It's an extremely approachable platform, and even has live battles that you can spectate, replays to share, and a team builder that lets you import and export teams with just simple text. In fact, I'll actually have a team that you can import in the video description below, that I'm going to show you how to build really shortly. Before we get too far into things though, I really recommend starting by clicking the Active Battles button on the right, selecting 1300 plus ELO, and watching a ton of battles to get a good feel for what good teams look like and how they should be played. I also have a playlist of Wi-Fi battles that I encourage you to watch as well in the video description below. If you're intimidated by team building, and you just want to get in the fun online or with your friends, then I recommend starting with unrated random battles. You can also challenge your friends to random battles by scrolling to the bottom, going to Find a User, and clicking Challenge. Then select Random Battle as your format of choice, you just scroll up a little bit. Random battles are a great way to get into battling, and the teams they generate actually showcase viable movesets that you can use in your own teams later. Pokémon Showdown even scales the levels of your Pokémon based off their power and usage to make random battles significantly more balanced. The level scaling is only for random battles, though, of course. The goal of this video is to help you get started playing online, and hopefully encourage some of you to give competitive Pokémon a try. If you're interested, I have plenty of Wi-Fi battles on my channel, as well as videos for a wide variety of other strategy games like Age of Empires 2. You can find links to everything you need in the video description below, including my social media and my Twitch stream, where I live stream every weekend. If you're a Twitch subscriber, then during my live streams, feel free to ask my mods for a link to the subscriber Discord, and play some battles with my other viewers, or even me. During my live streams, I hope to involve you all in some community battles, team reviews, and all sorts of interesting formats as a way to keep my content fresh and continue my tradition of viewer interaction. But without further ado, let's get into what makes competitive Pokémon so compelling. After all, I think most of us breezed through the single-player games when we were a kid without much of a challenge. Once again though, much like Age of Empires 2, the multiplayer side of Pokémon is absolutely nothing like the single-player campaign. Pokémon requires two very distinct skill sets, team building and in-game decision making. Both are incredibly complicated, and I will cover the basics of each of them in this video. First though, let's start with an example of interesting in-game decision making. Imagine this situation. You have a Charizard, a Venusaur, and a Blastoise on your team, and your opponent has the same roster. You decide to lead with their Charizard, and your opponent leads with their Venusaur. You immediately have the type advantage here, because your Charizard is a fire and flying type, and your opponent's Venusaur is grass and poison. Venusaur's grass typing is weak to both your fire and flying attacks. So what should we do here? Do you go for the flamethrower because it deals the most damage, and it is the most likely to kill off Venusaur in one hit? Actually, the correct play here is to go for wing attack instead, despite it being the weaker base power move. That is because your opponent cannot risk losing his slash her Venusaur to your Flamethrower, and therefore, they must switch out. They are likely to choose Blastoise to resist Charizard's Flamethrower. Bearing both of these facts in mind, the safest play is to go for Wing Attack, because Wing Attack is still super effective against Venusaur if your opponent stays in, but it also deals neutral damage to the opposing Blastoise and Charizard. Once your opponent makes their choice to switch in their Blastoise, then you can switch out to your own Venusaur in response. Now we're in a really interesting situation. You threaten the opposing Blastoise with the Grass-type Giga Drain, and the opposing Blastoise threatens your own Venusaur with its Ice Beam. So what do you do now? In this situation, it all comes down to the two speed stats, and the options that both players have. 
From typing explanation mark data in the chat, you can find out that Venusaur is ever so slightly faster than Blastoise is, so you actually don't fear the Ice Beam, and you can attack it first. Your opponent probably knows this, and then will switch out to their Charizard, who resists the Giga Drain. This is your opportunity to go for Sludge Bomb instead, because it hits Charizard, Blastoise, and Venusaur for neutral damage. But what if your opponent stays in and uses Ice Beam? Well, good news is, your Venusaur will first deal some nice neutral damage with Sludge Bomb, and then it will live the Ice Beam due to Venusaur's high defensive stats. Remember that in Pokémon, moves that are the same type as the user get 50% extra base damage, and what we call the same type attack bonus, or STAB for short. So this Sludge Bomb is going to hurt a lot more than that Ice Beam, because Blastoise is just a pure water type, and we're both grass and poison. Then the next turn, you're faster than the Blastoise, and then you can safely go for the Giga Drain to finish off the opposing Blastoise before it can kill you in return with an Ice Beam. Giga Drain also has the nice secondary effect of healing you for half the damage it dealt, so your Venusaur will recover off most of the damage it took from Ice Beam last turn. This series of plays puts you in the best possible situation to win the game, and the steps we took to get there required a lot of deep analysis. While Pokémon certainly has a small luck factor to it, the best player almost always comes out on top by analyzing situations the way we just did. So when you're playing, always try to focus on the many different ways the match could have played out if you made a different series of plays earlier, rather than that one time your Stone Edge missed. You'll often find that there were many different plays that you could have made early on to put yourself in a better situation. After all, Pokémon is all about the mind games and predictions. It's an incredibly simple game on the surface, but requires some of the most interesting strategy and game planning that I've ever seen in a competitive game. And the best part is, this example only scratches the surface of how complicated a seemingly basic situation can actually be. Pokémon is a giant puzzle, and every team in every game is a completely new one to solve. Now that we've covered some basic strategy, let's build a team. But remember, team building can be intimidating at first, so I encourage you to start with random battles or watch some other players play battles live while you get more comfortable with the game. And after you're done with this tutorial, definitely check the video description below for a link to an introductory Wi-Fi battle commentary video I did where I walk you all through my thought process step by step. It's a really in-depth and interesting video, but of course, now it's time to build a team. One other thing I need to mention before we get too far into things is that Pokémon Showdown is actually divided into several distinct tiers and metagames that you can play. These each have their own unique sets of rules, and it's pretty complicated, so I'm not going to go that much into detail in this video, but basically the team I'm going to be building is for RU, and I really recommend playing the RU tier or some of the lower tiers at first, since OU is generally very competitive, and it also, I mean all the tiers are competitive, but also... Oh, you can be pretty unforgiving, because that's where the most powerful Pokémon lie. Basically, the tiers are based off how often the Pokémon is used in the metagame, and RU is nice as a place to start, because you can use all the Pokémon in the tier below the tier you're playing in, and you'll find that in RU you can actually use Pokémon from NU and PU with relative ease. Whereas in OU, you typically get a little more punished for using off-meta Pokémon. You can still do it though, and OU was a great tier to play that I love playing as well, but for the purposes of this video, I recommend starting with RU, and that's what this team I'm going to show you is going to be quite strong in. So here's how you can start building a team. The first thing that you should do is to just pick a Pokémon to build your team around. In this case, I'm going to go with the Pokémon Deblade, because not only do I think it looks cool, but also, it's an excellent win condition. So, generally, just pick a Pokémon that you really like, and then you can help build the team around it by picking five Pokémon that can support it well. What else does every team need? Well, besides a win condition, so in this case, it's Deblade, so if Deblade sets up a Swords Dance, which boosts its attack, it can sweep the enemy team with its moves, like Shadow Sneak, which always goes first, and it has great coverage with Iron Head and Sacred Sword. That's our win condition. Besides a win condition, your team, at the minimum, needs one defensive wall and one specially defensive wall. These are Pokémon that are super defensive. They have either high HP or high special defense or regular defense to soak up hits and support our win condition slash sweeper. Every team needs at least one defensive wall and one specially defensive wall. There are a wide variety of ways to build teams, of course, there are multiple different play styles, an infinitely deep amount of teams that you can build, 
but when you're starting, make sure that you always have a defensive wall, a special wall, and a win condition. So how do you identify what Pokémon can be a win condition or a defensive or special wall? Well, it's going to take a lot of experience, but there are also plenty of resources online, links to in the description below and on the screen, if you'd like to just learn a little bit more about the metagame. The truth is, is that every Pokémon can actually fill a wide variety of roles and movesets based off the way you set up their stats, the way you pick their abilities, their held items, the moves they carry, so you actually have a lot of options. But on the screen here, you can see the two walls that I have selected for this sample team, which again, you can actually import via the video description below by just copy-pasting the text. The walls that I've selected today are Milotic and Umbreon. Milotic will be our physical wall. What qualities make it a good physical wall? Well, for starters, it has the ability Marvel Scale, which means that whenever it has a status effect on it, its defense is raised by 50%. That's pretty good. It's worth noting that Milotic can either be a physical or special wall, and oftentimes, unless the stats are particularly lopsided on a Pokémon, they can actually be either. This is again assuming they're defensive Pokémon. And we look at the way, again, Milotic stats are set up, and we can tell it's a defensive Pokémon. Same thing with Umbreon. To make sure that our defensive Pokémon can actually survive, they both carry the held item Leftovers, which will restore 1 16th of their maximum HP every turn. They also carry a wide variety of utility moves. Again, they're not here to do damage, they're here to soak up attacks. Because there are two types of attacks in Pokémon, physical attacks and special attacks. Physical attacks work off your attack stat, special attacks work off your special attack stat. And you need a Pokémon on your team that's capable of soaking up both of those. So in this case, Milotic is our max defense wall. And it's got Scald to help burn enemy physical attackers. The burn status effect actually cuts their attack stat, super useful here. It's got Ice Beam for coverage. It's got Toxic in case your opponent switches out into one of their own walls and you can slowly whittle it down, Toxic being a negative status effect that the damage increases every single turn they stay in. And it has Recover to give Milotic some longevity and allow it to keep soaking up hits. This is a great Milotic set, and there are also plenty of other options here, of course, and that's what makes Pokémon so interesting. Take a look at Umbreon. Umbreon is like the perfect support for our team, and it's got an excellent special defense stat. Of course, we can tell by its lackluster attack stats that it's probably, you know, an offensive Umbreon, you're going to have to get a little creative, maybe running moves like Curse or something like that. But in this case, we're going full special defense. Foul Play is a great move for a Pokémon with a crappy attack stat, and particularly it's great here because it actually works off our opponent's attack stat in the damage calculation. That's pretty nifty. Pokémon Showdown explains all of this in full, which really helps people get into the game. We also carry Wish. Wish will heal Umbreon, giving it some longevity, but also if I use Wish and then I switch out, I can also heal any other member of my team, which makes it just a great support Pokémon. Uh, Umbreon carries Protect, which guarantees that the Wish actually gets to affect itself, so I can wish and then protect the next turn to get that guaranteed heal, and hopefully they're being whittled down by the Toxic that our Melodic just put on them. And it also has Heal Bell, uh, which Umbreon can use to remove these status effects from every member of its team. This is a very flexible move slot, and so are really all of these. This Heal Bell could be easily be replaced with something like Toxic or War, for example. It's up to you, and it's going to depend on the rest of the team. It's also going to depend a little bit on the metagame too, and that's another thing that makes Pokémon so interesting, is that based off the threats that you face on the ladder, you're definitely going to have to continually adjust your team to meet your needs. You may find that Heal Bell just doesn't work that often, or you may find that it's an absolute necessity, and the metagame is continually evolving over time. So far on our team, we have an excellent win condition, and two Pokémon that are capable of supporting it. If our Deblade gets burned or something like that, then Umbreon can use Heal Bell to remove the burn. And then of course, if there's a physical attacker that's threatening our Deblade, Milotic can switch in and take the hit. And if there's a special attacker, Umbreon can come in as well. So what else are we missing? Well, the remaining three slots are pretty flexible, but I definitely recommend considering a good lead slash utility Pokemon as well. Now, Umbreon already offers a lot of utility, right? But we still need usually a little bit more. So the fourth Pokemon that I'm going to go with today is actually going to be Nidoqueen. So in general, most competitive teams in Pokemon actually carry one entry hazard move, or in some cases they can carry more than one, but usually they all carry one. Now what is an entry hazard move? This would be a move like Stealth Rock, Spikes, Toxic Spikes, or Sticky Web, all of which don't do anything that turn they're used, but every time your opponent switches out, their Pokémon either take damage or something bad happens to them. 
It's important that every team has one entry hazard user, as well as a Pokémon that is capable of removing the opposing entry hazards, because you're going to be doing a lot of switching in competitive Pokémon, trying to predict what your opponent is going to do and play around that. So, I recommend running one Pokémon on your team that has an entry hazard move, and then one Pokémon that's capable of removing it. In this case, Nidoqueen will be the Pokémon of choice, running the Stealth Rock move, which will whittle our opponents down every time they switch out. Nidoqueen as well, since we actually already have plenty of utility moves on our Umbreon, for example, and a little bit of utility in our Milotic, I think it's okay for Nidoqueen to just be a very heavy attacker. Generally, it's good to set up your entry hazards as early as possible in a game, so it's nice if we can lead with Nidoqueen if possible, but based off your opponent's team, that won't always be the case, and it's okay to not get up Stealth Rocks on turn 1, that's fine. But we do want to get them up if we have the opportunity. If you think your opponent's going to switch out, let's set up Stealth Rocks. Otherwise, let's deal some heavy damage. Here's one of the cool things about what makes this Nidoqueen set awesome, is the ability Sheer Force. Sheer Force is a little complicated to understand, but basically it means that this Pokémon's attacks that have secondary effects don't actually get the secondary effect, but instead deal extra damage. So Ice Beam has a small chance to freeze, Thunderbolt has a small chance to paralyze them, and those moves deal extra damage, Earth Power as well. This also means that Nidoqueen doesn't take damage from its Life Orb held item, which boosts its attack's damage, but it loses one-tenth of its HP after every attack. This is a great held item to use on offensive Pokémon like Nidoqueen, and it's even better because Nidoqueen doesn't take the damage from it. That's pretty sick. So we only have two Pokémon left here, and these slots are really flexible. So for the purposes of this team though, I think I'd like a little bit more support. I feel like our team is awfully weak to ground type moves right now. For example, Nidoqueen's weak to ground, and our wind condition over there, Deblade's also weak to ground. So how about a Pokémon with Levitator or Flying type? Flygon sounds pretty good. So Flygon's got Levitate, making it immune to ground moves with its ability, and another thing our team is really lacking is a bit in the speed department. I really like to build teams that have a revenge killer, and this means that the Pokémon either has a move that always goes first, like Deblade actually has Shadow Sneak, which is a great way to pick off opposing threats that might be really low on HP, but maybe they have like a massive attack stack because they already set up a Swords Dance. So Deblade can pick them off, but it's really nice to have more revenge killers. So Flygon, we're going to slap a Choice Scarf Held Item on there, boosting its speed by 1.5, which is absolutely fantastic, but it does lock it into being able to only use one move before you switch out. These Choice Items, there's a Choice Scarf, a Choice Specs, and a Choice Band, the Choice Band for Attack, the Choice Specs for Special Attack, are really useful in competitive play, but they can be quite difficult to get used to, so we only have one Choice Item user on this team for that reason. The cool thing about this set is that this makes Flygon absurdly fast, so if everything on your opponent's team is really weak, you can actually just sweep them with a Choice Scarf Outrage and probably outspeed everything on their team. So Flygon's going to come in there whenever one of our Pokémon dies, and we need to pick off an opposing threat that's kind of low in HP and we think we can kill it. There are a limited number of Pokémon that can learn Rapid Spin or Defog. In this case, we're going to give it to Flygon. Even though Flygon has a Choice Scarf and Defog doesn't deal any damage, it's actually still okay to run Defog on a Choice Scarf Pokémon. You just have to Defog and then switch out of there. But really, you're not going to be using Defog that many times during the match. You're actually only going to use it when you think your opponent's not just going to attack you and kill you. Also with the Choice Scarf, we're more guaranteed to get the Defog off safely. It's worth noting that on this moveset, it's also okay to swap Outrage for Dragon Claw if you find Outrages locking you into 2-3 turns to be rather unyieldy. And we have U-Turn if we want to be bold, and you think your opponent's going to switch out, you can actually just U-Turn out there, and if they're really low on HP, it might just kill them, and then you get a free switch. So U-Turn is a really sick move to have on your team, and in general, it's nice to have a Pokémon on your team that either has U-Turn or it has Volt Switch, and usually we call those like Pivot Pokémon, you know, things that you can just switch into and then get out of there when your opponent switches out. Flygon in this case has U-Turn, it's great. We can use Flygon here as an excellent offensive pivot, because anytime we think our opponent's going to use a Ground-type move, boom, just switch in Flygon, it's immune to it with Levitate, and then when they switch out because they're freaked out that Flygon's going to nuke them with an Earthquake or an Outrage, you can just U-turn out of there and maintain offensive momentum. The last Pokémon on our team, I have decided for the purposes of this video, why not Salazzle? The other thing our team is missing that it could sorely need is a Z-move. This is a new mechanic introduced in Gen 7 for Pokémon, which is it's a held item that you carry that can't be knocked off. This is super important because knockoff is a very popular move in the metagame that removes opposing held items and deals additional damage if they have one. 
So these Z moves are super complicated, not gonna go over the entirety of them in this video, but it's really nice to have one Z move user on your team. And you can actually only have one. So it's a held item in this case, Poisonium Z. It's worth noting that when building a team, you have a ton of different options with how you want to use your Z move and where. Z moves can only be used once per battle, and they have a wide variety of different powerful effects. For example, with Salazzle, we can use our Z Crystal held item on our Sludge Wave move to boost its power to obscene levels. Or we can use it with Toxic to still badly poison our opponent, but also boost our defense by one level. Z moves add a lot of depth to competitive Pokemon, and I encourage you to experiment with using them both offensively and defensively on all sorts of different Pokemon. Salazzle is going to be our wall breaker. Salazzle's Z-Move is a one-time, super powerful poison-type attack. And these Z-Moves are all one-time, super powerful attacks that either boost a lot of stats or just blow your opponent away. And Salazzle is a great wall breaker and adds some serious firepower to this team that I feel like it was missing. So we got Fire Blast, Sludge Wave, and Hidden Power Grass for some excellent damage. And we also have Toxic, which with the ability Corrosion, guarantees that we get the poison on any Pokemon that is otherwise immune to it. This includes poison types and steel types, which is pretty sick. This last slot toxic, though, can easily be something else. Like, it could be Nasty Plot, for example, and then if we were going to run Nasty Plot to boost our special attack, then we'd want to use the hidden ability Oblivious instead of Corrosion, because we don't have the move toxic. Hopefully that makes sense. So Lazzle is a very fragile Pokemon, but it really rounds out the team, and can pick off like really, really bulky Pokemon with an unexpectedly powerful Poisonium Z Sludge Wave. Here are a couple common mistakes that you can avoid when building your own team later. Oftentimes, I see new players create teams with redundant type weaknesses. You should never have more than three Pokemon on your team that are weak to a specific type of move. And if you do have three, then you definitely want to have one Pokemon on your team with an immunity to that type. In this sample team, Flygon is immune to ground, and our other two walls are capable of taking strong ground-type attacks like Earthquake quite well. And even though this team does have a weakness to ground, it has some excellent defensive typing on it as well. For example, Salazzle is weak to Psychic, but that's why we have Umbreon, who is immune to Psychic. And we also have Deblade, who resists that. So this team has its pros and cons for sure. But overall, it's very well-rounded. Another important note to keep in mind when building a team is that you always want a balanced mix of physical and special attackers. Every team you build should contain at least a 4 to 2 or 3 to 3 ratio of Pokemon with physical or special attacks. If only one Pokemon on your team has physical attacks, then your team will really struggle with breaking through opposing special walls. Your various attacking moves should always come in a wide variety of types, both elemental and physical and special. Another common pitfall is poor offensive move coverage. When picking a Pokemon for your team, it's a good idea to give it moves that are a wide variety of different types. Rather than giving this Charizard 4 fire type moves, let's try giving it a nice balanced move set like Flare Blitz, Earthquake, Roost, and Dragon Dance. This is a much better move set because most things that resist Flare Blitz, like water types or rock types, are either weak to or take neutral damage from Earthquake. One of the things that makes the sample team so threatening is that our Nidoqueen has excellent offensive type coverage. If you are playing in UU, OU, or Ubers, so all of the above tiers, it's also a really excellent idea to have a Mega Evolution on your team, since that's typically where the most powerful Mega Evolution Pokémon reside. In this particular team, we don't pack one, and that's okay, but it's just important to do that in the higher tiers. The tiers in Pokemon Showdown do shift from time to time to ensure the most balanced metagame possible. If anything in the sample team ends up shifting up a tier and you can no longer use it in the RU tier, then feel free to replace that Pokemon with one that has a similar typing and fills a similar role. For example, if Milotic moves up to UU, then consider replacing it with something like Blastoise or Vaporeon as our new defensive wall. Beyond watching battles, which I definitely recommend that you do, there are also plenty of useful websites out there such as Smogon, Bulbapedia, Cerebi, etc. that all have a wide variety of useful resources on learning more about Pokémon, their movesets, and their usage in the metagame. Since the metagame in Pokémon is so complex and continually evolving, Smogon can't possibly list all the viable movesets for each Pokémon, and they might not always be up to date either. There are a wide variety of other viable movesets that you will encounter on the ladder, and it's important for your success that you are capable of also adapting by creating your own. 
It's a great resource to get started learning about common movesets, but make sure you adapt to the metagame, and that you're also looking at the correct generation of Pokémon. You can find a link to the Sun and Moon Pokédex in the video description below. And of course, huge thanks to Smogon and the entire Pokémon Showdown staff for doing such a great job maintaining the competitive scene for Pokémon. Seriously, they put in so much work, it's unbelievable. Beyond that, there are also other competitive formats maintained by VGC, and I'm also really glad that Nintendo has been generally supportive of competitive Pokémon in general. Like, really, it's just... It is a wonderful community, and I hope this video encourages you all to give it a try and become a part of it. For those of you who are playing on the cartridges, the VGC metagame is actually the official one, and it's really interesting and different, but that's a topic for another video. And if you're interested in occasionally hearing my thoughts on some of the major Pokémon news or anything in the competitive scene, then I definitely encourage you to follow me on Facebook and Twitter. Links in the video description below. It's also just a great way to support the channel in general. Hopefully you guys found this tutorial useful. If you did, I would really appreciate if you take the time to leave a like rating as well as a comment below. And I look forward to just playing competitive Pokémon with you all. I hope that this video encourages you to give it a try. And there are plenty of examples of full battles in the video description below, which should really show you exactly what makes competitive Pokémon so awesome. I love this game, and I hope you all give it a shot. You know, it's like Age of Empires 2, where yeah, I just grew up with it, and I, I loved the game so, so much, and... Man, it blew my mind when I figured out that both of my favorite childhood games actually have some of the most in-depth strategy I've ever seen in a game, period. And I hope that this tutorial does a good job getting you introduced to the game. You can actually copy and paste the team that I built for you right now in the video description below, and you can just import it straight into Pokémon Showdown via text. It's that simple. Thank you so much for watching and supporting the channel as always, especially for the content I do for games beyond just Age of Empires 2. It's one of the best ways to encourage me to continue doing Age of Empires 2 content, to grow the Age of Empires community by exposing more people to AoE, and just to support the channel in general. So thank you so much for being awesome, you guys are great. And I look forward to seeing you all on my weekly live streams and on my YouTube channel. Thank you.